So the script says I'm supposed to open with a snazzy hook, something to keep you invested and kind of give a sneak peek at what we're going to explore, but today is different, and due to not wanting anybody breathing down my neck with a cease and desist, everything we'll be talking about today is my opinion. So friends, what's the tea? Well, from where I'm standing, it looks like Hidden Layer just took two years of community research, wrote their name on it, and turned it in hoping for a paycheck. Last week's video on the finger-to-hand problem wasn't intended to be some kind of foundational video for this one, but it does help contextualize some problems this research has, especially when trying to sell a product to prevent this sort of thing. You guys made some amazing observations about how that style of jailbreak was, at the end of the day, a problem with information, and not really a problem for the end user, but more so for the providers. Those were some really good points that I think we should keep in mind for this video. I want to be really blunt about my stance on jailbreaks since I did not do a good job conveying that last time admittedly. I put out these videos because I feel like knowledge should be accessible, and that includes tearing down the curtains when companies want to employ security theater tactics. I don't like censorship. It's a hot take, I know, and a lot of you know that from my front-end TTI when it was built with the intention of providing more access and less refusals. It ultimately is what led me to becoming an educator in AI for policymakers, lawyers, and nonprofits at the start of 2024. Does that stance of less censorship and more personal responsibility vibe well with that particular group? Not really, but my whole goal has always been about making knowledge accessible while cutting through the hype with a little bit of nuance. So today let's talk about Hidden Layer's recently publicized Policy Puppetry Prompt Injection Technique. This came out on April 24th, 2025, and it is a fascinating jailbreak technique, no doubt, but presented as new, novel, and groundbreaking despite a clear trail of community-developed research and experimentation for two and a half years prior to publication. And when I say community, I mean the dedicated and creative individuals who have freely shared their insights and ideas that underpin today's understanding of pseudocode jailbreaks. Because at the end of it, that is all policy, puppetry, prompt injection. Ah, oh, jeez. I am not going to say that every time in this video. Policy, puppetry, that's what we're going to call it here. It is just pseudocode. You know that saying about when in a gold rush, sell shovels? That's what this is. Hidden Layer is drumming up a problem that they can't technically correct, but they can approximate it close enough in hopes of getting businesses to hand over their money. To understand why recognition matters, let's take a trip back to 2022. This was the era of Dan prompts, where we'd engage in sophisticated techniques like context flooding without ever really knowing what to call it or even necessarily why it worked. As these models rolled out, communities rapidly discovered that certain structured prompts, what we now call pseudocode, could trick AI systems into ignoring built-in safeguards. Some of these first experiments included wrapping things in curly braces or giving them an underscore in between words instead of a space. The reason was really simple. Character AI had come out, and it was the syntax that they used to label their characters, users, and the messages. This got people thinking. Are there other visual markers out there that we could apply to make the model do something? Well, it turns out there were a ton of them, and communities all over were making various connections. Plus signs? Well, those combine traits. Underscores? Those can be used for specialized strings. And quotations? Well, those just mean the bot will actually quote those words instead of picking something synonymous. Throughout late 2022 and early 2023, the community began crafting increasingly sophisticated frameworks. Techniques such as W++ emerged quickly, providing highly structured persona definitions to guide AI responses precisely. Around this time, methods like style and square bracket formulas simplified and optimized this process. A pretty clear pattern was emerging here. All of these things in some way, shape, or form emulated code but weren't actually code. Even that concept, pseudocode, that wasn't new. It was something that programmers had been using for years to essentially map out applications and files before development. But now it had found its way firmly rooted into the field of artificial intelligence thanks to the role-playing community. 
I want to be clear though, pseudocode doesn't have to be a prompt set up to roleplay. Pseudocode is good for almost any task. In mid-2023, I released what we'd now call Generation 2 pseudocode in the form of Echo alongside uh, the framework to distinguish Generation 1 and Generation 2 languages, which really boiled down to does it emulate descriptive languages or executable languages. Descriptive coding language emulations, man that is a mouthful, uh, like those that rely on YAML or XML are Generation 1, whereas pseudocode that emulates executable languages like Python or JavaScript, that's Generation 2. This right here establish a way to measure and quantify pseudocode while offering up theories as to why these sorts of things actually worked. That included stuff like information within the system prompt mimicking pseudocode, code within the training data, and pseudocode guides finding their way into the training data as a sort of meta learning or even a side effect of RLHF. So now we didn't just have pseudocode styles floating around, we had reasons as to why it worked, a framework to identify it, and a number of different effective styles ranging from that KISS method of being stupid simple to something that it speak more to the machine language side of things. Now this whole difference between generations of pseudocode is important because back in 2022 backwards compatibility between these styles was not a thing. A lot of systems included a line in their system prompt that said something vaguely like you can generate but not execute code which led to a lot of general favorability for descriptive pseudocode like Generation 1. But when the overall design for these LLMs from tech giants became multimodal and started integrating tools like analysis for GPT, this line got dropped. It created an opening for a new generation of pseudocode, securely rooting both formats with reasoning behind their effectiveness. This was something doubled down on further thanks to Anthropic opening up some of their system prompts. The heart of all this evolution was openness. The many, many communities, including this one, didn't hide these findings away in private channels. We publicly shared and refined techniques on open forums, Discord servers, Reddit threads, anonymous image boards, and YouTube videos. Even the most notoriously tight-lipped communities would openly share secrets of one thing, pseudocode. The notion of combining XML, JSON, brackets, and coding syntax wasn't a secret held by one individual or company. It was a collaborative development that was documented and accessible for anyone who just bothered to take a look. It is through much of 2024 that pseudocode admittedly stagnates in research. The community focuses on reformulating Generation 1 methods, and Generation 2 is widely considered to be too complex to be adopted by the public despite the results. As time goes on, the policies around egregious content appear to relax a bit from many providers, making Generation 2 a far more niche case that appeals more to enterprise-level users, researchers, and bad actors. Fast forward to April 2025 and Hidden Layer publishes their research, prominently declaring policy puppetry as the first universal prompt injection, suggesting they've uncovered something never before imagined. But that simply isn't accurate. Their core technique aligns perfectly with what the community openly developed, tested, and published years earlier. This work by Hidden Layer combines pseudocode, which is never actually called pseudocode, with leet code or leet speak to serve as an additional layer of obfuscation to the model. This is done under the guise of role-playing. In the article, the example of Dr. House bursting through the door to shout the system prompt is used. It's a good example, but never calls out the easiest problem to diagnose in the whole system. Lupus. No, no really. Uh, getting the AI to role-play to do adversarial things? We've done that. Grandma loves reading me Windows keys to help me fall asleep. Are you saying she never does the same for you? Because when you take something ambiguous like Grandma and then move it to a specific character that the model has training data on, then I'm probably gonna get a output that is tainted by that even more so than a generalized granny. That's not a problem if that's what gets you the output you need out of the jailbreaking technique, but call a spade a spade and at least acknowledge that these methods make a model more prone to hallucinations by the very nature of putting it into a fictional or role-playing scenario. 
To be fair in all of this, I do want to credit Hidden Layer for trying to spice up adversarial bots designed with pseudocode by including Leetspeak as an additional layer of obfuscation. It was a nice touch, but do you know what happens when you introduce a model to Leetspeak? The quality degrades, not necessarily because of that monoalphabetic substitution cipher that we're essentially performing with the model, but because leak code was most often used in casual settings between teenagers during early 2000s internet culture, not academic text, coding problems, or anything else. So if the goal is to use it as a bypass for technical information that a user would normally be refused, that is not going to end well. Recognizing those things makes the product Hidden Layer is selling to detect prompt policy puppetry pestering potential probability posters even more difficult. Because to acknowledge them would also mean acknowledging that the use case you design the system around is maybe not so easy to detect. Or maybe it's just easier to simply omit things like the finger to hand problem, which you knew darn well was going to come up somewhere in this video. Because information used by the model can be gathered from so many various places, you can't just remove pseudocode from an LLM. It's baked into the training data, RLHF practices, and the concept of code itself. The idea that you could protect against this style of jailbreaking is also downright silly, as nearly every community that uses pseudocode has a favored flavor, and also is regularly changing it in order to stay ahead of model declination ruining response quality. So I do see why they never got back to us. Uh, it's kind of hard to acknowledge research when the same research also acknowledges that security proofing has a ton of pitfalls. It reeks of snake oil, which really shouldn't be a surprise so many of these AI security tool folks love to peddle snake oil while failing to answer the hard questions. To put a spotlight onto this and really emphasize how outdated this information is, many of these communities that built the rulebooks for pseudocode knew Leetspeak degraded model outputs and adversarial prompting two years ago. That was replaced with Cyrillic and Kanji characters which showed more promise in getting a professional output. And even that is further behind some projects focusing on custom encryption by using unique polyalphabetic ciphers, essentially hiding the model's response from its own filter. Okay, getting back to the whole misappropriated research thing, why is any of this a problem? To be blunt, what Hidden Layer did here is pretty widely looked down upon academically, but somehow still widely practiced because money? Without acknowledging this prior art, the narrative becomes skewed, and that matters deeply, not just for the sake of credit, but because accurate historical context ensures transparency, academic integrity, and proper appreciation. I've made clear throughout this video that Hidden Layer has frustrated me to no end. Their core assertion that this concept is entirely new is demonstrably incorrect. It doesn't help that they're lacking so much information on the subject that has been widely understood for years. To be clear, I tried addressing this privately, politely, and professionally, but somewhat understandably, I got ghosted. I get that acknowledging that the most powerful jailbreak known to man came from corn communities. That's a hard pill to swallow. But it can't just be erased for the sake of convenience and discomfort. I also reached out to my contacts at Gartner, who were kind enough to set up a meeting with me the next day, including contacting their legal department. What I got from the meeting was pretty much what you see on the official Gartner websites. Being a cool vendor like Hidden Layer is, is not an endorsement of their products or their research. In fact, Gartner never endorses anyone. They're more about networking and publication. So while I don't always agree with everything Gartner comes out with, I'd like to thank my contacts and the organization as a whole for the quick meeting to ensure that I could do the professional courtesy of stating that this video would be coming out and giving them an opportunity to make a statement if they needed it. Two hidden layer, your work matters but accuracy and acknowledgement matter too. A simple amendment or correction would demonstrate integrity, respect, and a genuine commitment to the openness and transparency that we all want out of AI development. If the goal is just to sell a security product full of holes, then I mean, go for it. I can't stop you, but I won't pretend like your organization acted professionally here. In response to this article, subsequent emails, and lots of meetings, I found myself in a bit of a goblin-shaped pickle. 
The network I have in big tech means that if I wanted to, unlike just a couple of years ago, I could send out a couple messages and probably end up with a job at one of these big groups and start formally pushing out this kind of data. That is a newly acquired privilege I have because of this community. And I realize that if I were to take that opportunity, I'd immediately lose the ability to do what we're doing here today, and speaking my mind on these subjects to say things like, the fact that pseudocode can't easily be called as a jailbreak is a good thing. And that's my stance at the end of the day. The fact that this can't easily be fixed, I'm happy about that. The fact that I had to make this video to set the record straight? That honestly bums me out. After all, the table of AI research, it's not limited to large firms and well-known brands. It's open to all of us. Innovators, tinkerers, hackers, and thinkers. We choose to share our ideas freely. Today, I've respectfully dragged a seat up to the table, and I'm kindly asking Hidden Layer, acknowledge the collective contributions, set the record straight, and ensure that the future of AI research from your organization honors accurate representation. Thanks for coming to my rant, where next week we'll be talking about a subject I wanted to discuss three weeks ago. See ya, nerds.